Tonight on CBC Vancouver News, escorted out. Uh, I'm shocked more than anything else. Why two high-ranking members of the BC legislature have been suddenly suspended. Plus, no support claims the federal government is leaving at-risk youth with nowhere to turn for help in the middle of a bloody gang war. And the, their inability to understand the, how the technology works. The province's plan to bring ride hailing to BC has some wondering if it will give consumers any choice at all. This is CBC Vancouver News. A shocking and dramatic scene at the BC legislature this morning. Sergeant at Arms Gary Lenz and Clerk of the House Craig James suddenly escorted out of the building and put on administrative leave. They are the two most senior administrative employees of the BC legislature. The uh, Speaker's office will be putting out a statement and any other further questions will be addressed you, by the Attorney General. Thank you. That's, that's all I can say at this can point. Do you have any idea what this is pertaining to? No, I don't. And neither does the sergeant at arms. Good evening. The reason for those sudden departures remains a mystery tonight. But we do know these key officials are under criminal investigation and that two special prosecutors have been appointed. The CBC's Tanya Fletcher is in Victoria with more on what's being called an unprecedented turn of events. It all started when House Leader Mike Farnworth introduced a motion at the end of question period and watch as his hands shake while he reads it aloud. I move that Mr. Craig James, Clerk of the Legislative Assembly, and Mr. Gary Lenz, Sergeant at Arms, are placed on administrative leave with pay and benefits effective immediately. That motion passed unanimously. Minutes later, both men were escorted out of the building. Craig James was seen leaving his office with his personal belongings. He repeatedly told reporters he doesn't know what this is about. I have no idea. I mean, I, I have no idea, and, and uh, I think the sergeant at arms is equally shocked. Who runs this place if the leader, senior leadership is in here? Well, that's a good question. All questions are now being directed to the office of the speaker. A special advisor with the office addressed the media, and he says RCMP are conducting a criminal investigation. As far as I know, it is absolutely unprecedented, and if I can be frank, I mean, it's, it's disturbing. Um, it's disruptive. We certainly have people that can slide into that role in the interim to make sure that, uh, you know, the House can, can conduct business uh, in the meantime. It's still unclear what the allegations are or who brought them forward. The BC Prosecution Service says it was notified by RCMP as early as September 28th. However, Premier John Horgan says he was only told about it within the last 24 hours. I was briefed by uh, Mike Farnworth. He had been in consultation with the House leaders of the other two parties in the legislature as well as uh, officials in the Speaker's office. And the first I heard about it was yesterday. It was uh, shocking to be sure. As for how important their two roles are, the Clerk of the House is essentially the CEO of the Legislative Assembly. Last year, Craig James made about $400,000 in salary and travel expenses combined. The Sergeant of Arms, meanwhile, is in charge of maintaining order in the chamber. Last year, Gary Lenz made around $240,000 a year between salary and travel expenses. Now, the two men were seen driving away from the legislature together after all of this happened. The Crown says it has since appointed not one, but two special prosecutors due Due to the potential size and scope of the investigation. Tanya Fletcher, CBC News, Victoria. And we're learning more about the man found dead under the Golden Ears Bridge this weekend. Homicide investigators say Chad Wilson from Maple Ridge was a full patch member of the Hells Angels and they're now appealing to the gang for help. The CBC's Dan Burrett has been tracking these developments for us. Dan, this is a rare step. Anita, Mike, they're going straight to the source, if you will. Police have appealed to gang members directly and other people believed to be involved in criminal activity in the past to try to warn them, but this is unusual. 43-year-old Chad Wilson, as you mentioned, a full patch member of the Hells Angels. A Facebook page with his name on it is full of Hells Angels logos and gatherings. That's a photo of him there. Colleagues have also posted tributes to him online. Now, court records show Wilson was involved in a shootout in South Dakota with members of a rival gang in 2006. He says he was terrified. He was acquitted of murder after arguing self-defense, but was handed four years in prison after pleading guilty to illegal firearms possession. When he returned from the U.S., he and three other Hells Angels were arrested in Spain in 2013 and charged with trying to smuggle 300 kilos of cocaine into that country. 
They were sentenced to four years and six months in jail. And this Sunday, as we said, IHIT says Wilson's body was found under the Golden Ears Bridge. His death believed to be targeted, and IHIT now hoping his associates will help them find his killer. We have intimate knowledge about what happened to Chad Wilson. We need to speak with you, and we will go to wherever you are, and we will sit down and speak with you, and we will treat you with the utmost respect. We want to solve your friend, your associate's murder, as much as you do. Please reach out to IHIT today. Now IHIT waits to see if any of Chad Wilson's friends, fellow Hells Angels, or other associates take up that police officer offer, I should say. Interestingly, Wilson's Facebook page is a simple message at the top. Dead men tell no tales. Anita, Mike? All right, Dan, thanks very much. What started as a minor feud between teenagers in Abbotsford's Townline Hill neighborhood has erupted into a full-blown gang war. Several teens and young men connected to the feud have been killed in recent months in Abbotsford, Surrey, and elsewhere. Nonprofits that run programs for at-risk youth in both cities say anti-gang programs are needed more than they have ever been. But as Jesse Johnston reports, they're out of money. I couldn't control myself. Could it be my son? We can't show you her face because we can't identify her 17-year-old son who's on probation. But we can share her story. This mother from Abbotsford says her son grew up with a father who was an addict and abusive. When he was in elementary school, there were fights and suspensions. Then came high school, and with it, weapons and drugs. And one time I found a knife, but I asked her, oh, no, that's not mine, that's my friend's knife, like that. The woman saw news story after news story about the gang war, and every time her teenager would sneak out of the house at night, she was worried sick. So frustrated, but still I never gave up. Thanks to support and counseling from a nonprofit group, her son is now making positive choices and they're repairing their relationship. His goals are he, he wants to join army and uh, right now he is uh, playing soccer. The woman fears programs like In It Together, which helped her family, won't be around much longer to help others. Federal grants ran out in October, and because of the way the application process works, they have to reapply. And even if they're successful, money won't start trickling in until April. In a statement, Public Safety Canada says, regional public safety officials work closely with recipients throughout the life cycle of their project to help them. We can demonstrate the success through our measures. A recent donation will keep In It Together afloat for now, but similar programs in Surrey say they're not so lucky. We're stuck in purgatory, uh, unfortunately. So in 2013, we started this program through a civil forfeiture grant, but we can't apply for a grant again to keep that program going. It has to be a new, innovative idea. How ridiculous is that? So anti-gang programs will wait and hope the spring will bring prosperity so they can help bring peace. Jesse Johnston, CBC News, Surrey. Vancouver police have arrested a man suspected of sexually assaulting a woman in her West End apartment building. Surveillance footage captured early Saturday morning shows the suspect inside the building, located at Butte near Pendrel. The woman says he followed her and then attacked her. Police cannot release the man's identity until Crown Council has approved any charges, but they have revealed he is 34 years old. And the fanfare surrounding the B.C. government's ride-hailing announcement has quickly turned to disappointment for many. Now, some are calling it a watered-down version of the service, wondering if it'll give consumers any choice at all. Tina Lovegreen reports. People in Metro Vancouver have been clamoring for services like Uber for years, but what's coming their way may not be exactly what they want. A day after the provincial government unveiled its plan for ride-hailing services, disappointment from those who say it's too restrictive. And it feels time and time again um, like nobody uh, from the government's been in a lift ride or ride chair before because the supply and demand and the service element is how this whole thing works. The legislation would limit the number of ride-hailing cars on the road. You don't need a cap in this day and age, so it's problematic. Um, it could mean shortages uh, in the number of taxis. It could be longer wait times, higher prices. Um, you don't have a cap on the number of kind of coffee shops. The transportation minister says supply won't be a problem. 
That those are some of the, the details that still will need to be uh, worked out, but we're looking at having, making sure that there are cars available when we need them. Drivers will also need to get a Class 4 or commercial driver's license. That requires additional medical, security and safety checks. Also, special insurance, which transportation consultant Victor No says will limit the number of drivers. One of the benefits of ride hailing is that it can attract different types of people. If they want to work for a very quick shift, you know, it, just to make a few extra bucks, or if, they're more, if they want to be more full time, there's a range of flexibilities of what kind of positions they can take. Um, with a class four license, that sort of uh, reduces the, that flexibility. So with the restrictions, there are questions about whether ride hailing will be a viable business in BC. In Montreal, Uber threatened to leave in a fight over regulations. It made similar threats in other cities. Now, Uber and Lyft may still want to operate, but what I'll say is that if they do come, people will be like, hey, this service isn't all it's cracked up to be. Fares are just as high, you know, it's still hard to get a taxi. I'm still being refused rides, and that's all the fault of the government's legislation as it stands. Whatever version of ride hailing we get, it won't be for at least another year, possibly two. What's unclear is if people will notice a difference on the street. Tina Lovegreen, CBC News, Vancouver. A proposed development in the district of North Vancouver has been voted down. It would have meant 80 below market housing units, including a senior's respite care facility near Delbrook. As the CBC's Rafferty Baker reports, this may be a sign of what's to come with a fresh new city council. All those in favor? All those opposed? Motion fails. Is there it's impossible to say how the old council would have voted on the rezoning application last night, but many of the newly elected councillors campaigned on slow growth. And the majority in last night's meeting found various reasons to shut the project down for now. Simply put, we can do better. And if there are increased costs, from my point of view, that's a small price to pay for achieving a better community plan. If reluctance to support development projects becomes a trend, it could make things challenging for developers on the North Shore. Decision on another major development project was delayed until after the election. A Tsleil-Waututh Tooth First Nation and Darwin Properties project has been proposed near Second Narrows Bridge. It includes about a thousand housing units and workspace on a 45-acre site. District Councillor Jim Hansen isn't sold on the plan. This piece of land was a gravel quarry throughout most of the 20th century. Now it's a forest, nearly in Hansen's backyard. Well, I would need to know that much of what I regard as being a significant urban treasure uh, is going to be protected for all times and all peoples, and most importantly, protected for our ecology. And for North Van residents, there's one issue that just keeps coming up. I think really um, the traffic is a huge problem. Well, I think they should put in a third crossing. There's a lot of road rage because of all the uh, traffic on the roads. Hansen says North Vancouver residents also care about affordable housing. And he says if the right project is proposed, he could see supporting it. But for now, things are slowing down. Rafferty Baker, CBC News, North Vancouver. Well, there may have been slight improvements in recent years, but a new report shows child poverty remains a big problem here in B.C. Released by First Call, B.C. Child and Youth Advocacy Coalition, the report card shows one in five B.C. children and youth are growing up in poverty. That translates to more than 172,000 kids. And it appears minority groups, including Aboriginals and recent immigrants, are most at risk. Factors that make those groups overrepresented still exist, and that's discrimination in the labor market, discrimination in housing sometimes, uh, historical disadvantage of a variety of, of factors there. This fall, the BC government vowed to cut the province's child poverty rate in half by 2024. Details on just how that strategy will be funded, however, remain sparse. An update is expected with the next provincial budget in February. All new cars and trucks sold in B.C. in the year 2040 will have to be zero-emission vehicles. The province is planning to gradually increase its targets for the sale of electric cars and hydrogen fuel cell vehicles. The Car Dealers Association of British Columbia will be integral to that. The, the uh, providers of the vehicles will be integral to that. But most importantly, we need to give citizens the incentives they need to get out of their uh, heavy emission vehicles into low and zero emission vehicles in the years ahead. 
As part of the plan, an extra $20 million is being added to the incentive program for new car buyers. Right now, anyone who buys a clean energy vehicle is eligible for up to $6,000 in incentives. The province is also planning to more than double the number of electric charging stations to 151. Right now, 12,000 clean energy vehicles are registered in B.C., which the province says is the highest adoption rate in the country. And Johanna Wagstaff is here with a first check of the forecast. Those cars uh, don't need the windshield wipers on just yet. <laughs> Not yet, yes. That's the key there. <laughs> the rain is moving in quickly for our Wednesday forecast. Right now, it's a chilly but dry evening across uh, Metro Vancouver. In fact, across most of the south coast. But as I show you the satellite and radar, there is a system approaching. That big low pressure system sliding in from the south will bring a bit of a washout to our Wednesday. Uh, the day is looking to be bookended by heavier downpours with showers in between. Let's get to the silver lining. As we mentioned yesterday, we are looking to get some mountain snow. So in a way, this is almost the Christmas Eve for skiers and snowboarders before the first big snow. I say big, but taking you through that snow forecast, I think snow levels will be down around 1,200 meters. We could pick up a good 5 to 15, maybe even 20 centimeters for our local mountains. I'll uh, tell you when we'll actually be able to see it and when the clouds will clear up down here uh, a little later on in the show. Well, and it's not just exciting for skiers and snowboarders. I love a good snowfall. Sure. Thank you. I'm not alone then for all of us. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much, Johanna. You're welcome. Well, a warning from health officials tonight in Canada and the U.S. about romaine lettuce after several confirmed cases of E. coli bacterial infections, where investigators are focusing their search for the source of the outbreak coming up. Thanks for staying with us through the break here on Facebook Live tonight. We are spotlighting the BC author who last night won the richest prize in Canadian literature. That's the Giller Prize. That's a big prize. Victoria's Essie Adujan seemed a little taken off guard by the $100,000 win for her book, Washington Black. Have a look. Essie Adujan from Washington Black. The book follows the experience of an 11-year-old boy who escapes slavery on a Barbados sugar plantation with the help of his owner's kinder brother. There are so many different things that I was working with in that novel, but, um, you know, we're still living with the, the repercussions of, of, uh, of what, you know, transpired then, and, you know, we're still racial inequality and, and uh, you know, a sense of people's, some people's rights being privileged over others' rights. and. And, you know, these injustices are things that we're still dealing with today. I think that when we read stories of others' experiences, um, you know, people who are completely un unlike ourselves sometimes, and then we can look at these stories and see features of our own lives, um, or, or if not that, then at least uh, feel sympathy uh, with what the characters are going through. And then that is really the beginning of, of being able to come outside of ourselves and in the beginning of empathy and, and change. I think that's where change lies. Wow. Washington Black has also been nominated for other Canadian and international fiction awards. Congratulations to her. That is amazing. Incredible. Looks mm -hmm. like uh, one to add to the list. Absolutely. What are you reading? I am I'm disappointed that I haven't finished. I should have finished it a long time ago. Uh, the President is Missing, mm. James Patterson, mm -hmm. Bill, Bill Clinton. Clinton. When did you I start? I tell it? you right now, I am oh. responsible for authoring that book. Yeah, he he's contributed in a in a really intriguing way because, uh, of course, of his experience, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, they they wrote this book together, and uh, it's it's good. It's it's really good. I've been trying to get my husband to read that one yeah. for a few months, so maybe yeah, maybe you can convince him right, once you finish. Okay. What about you? Um, I so I'm usually into. Uh, a lot of war books, <laughs> not very light. Here comes the butt. Um, but I was recently in Hawaii, <laughs> so went, went the fluffier route, and I'm on the Crazy Rich Asians trilogy. Well, that's all right. It's not bad, and I haven't seen the movie. I wanted to read the book yeah. first, but I ended up reading all three almost done. So it's a good, like, vacation reading, or...? It's a good beach read, but now I'm back here with the rainy weather, trying to get through it. 
but it also reminds me of Hong Kong. I love Hong Kong. You've worked in Hong Kong. So. Yes. Oh, well, then I'll have to. Can I borrow it after you? Can I borrow them after you finish? Sure. That's great. <laughs> well, I'll give you The President is Missing if you give me the Crazy Rich Asian series. Fantastic. Learning so much about each other. <laughs> Thanks for watching. We will have more news coming up after uh, this lovely shot of downtown Vancouver. Morning tonight from health officials in Canada and the United States about romaine lettuce. Canadian public health notice went out to residents in Ontario and Quebec where it has been linked to 18 cases now of E. coli. However, health officials here in BC say there's no reason to be worried yet. Despite the outbreak, neither Canada or the U.S. are issuing a formal recall. So far it's just a warning and as Jacqueline Hansen explains, that is creating a bit of confusion. Just to be safe, this Toronto grocery store pulled all romaine lettuce off its shelves until it can figure out if selling the lettuce would put its customers at risk. When I came in here, it was one of the first things I was going to pay attention to to see whether they still had it on the shelf or not. What's going on to cause all these outbreaks? Some Canadian grocers haven't taken action yet and don't have to. Officials in Canada and the U.S. say they're still trying to figure out the source of the problem. Until then, no official recall. In the U.S., the advice to consumers is clear. If they had already uh, gone to the store and they have romaine lettuce in their home just to go ahead and throw it away and not to serve it. But in Canada, consumers are just being told to avoid it until more is known about the outbreak and the cause of contamination. Experts say this outbreak is like lightning striking twice. This strain of E. coli, O157, is the same one that was at the center of another romaine lettuce warning last December. Canada's public health agency says it suggests there may be a reoccurring source of contamination. The strain is also more likely than others to make people severely sick. Simply washing the lettuce won't help. Not only does it produce a diarrheal disease, but it can produce a toxin, a poison that involves the kidneys, so you can get subsequent kidney failure. Officials are concerned there could be more cases. We are getting reports from health departments that there are uh, some more illnesses being reported. The cause of last year's contamination was never determined, and experts say the source of this one will likely also be difficult to track. Lettuce is often repackaged on its way to stores or restaurants. For now, the lettuce delivered to this Toronto store will stay boxed up and out of reach of shoppers. Jacqueline Hansen, CBC News, Toronto. Canada is facing a severe shortage of some crucial prescription medications. In fact, you might be alarmed to hear 1,600 drugs are in short supply. Patients and pharmacists are now scrambling to fill those prescriptions. And as Christine Birak tells us, that's putting a growing number of patients at risk. Well, as of right now, I really only have four tablets of the brand name Wellbutrin left over. And he has a handful of generics. That's it for a drug used to treat depression called bupropion. We call neighboring pharmacies to see if they have any supply. This psychiatrist is now seeing anxious patients worried their medication will run out. It's a big deal. It's a very big deal. So when there's a shortage like this, some patients might scramble and they may be able to find another antidepressant that's effective, but they may not. DrugShortagesCanada.ca houses a master list of over a thousand medications in short supply. It reveals there are just two companies manufacturing bupropion in Canada. Why the shortage? Mylan Pharmaceuticals notes a delay in shipping. Valiant, now called Bosch Health, doesn't offer any explanation. If you suspect drug shortages are created by companies to raise prices, you're not alone. I had that thought in my mind, aha, it's evil pharma, but uh, really that's not the case. First of all, in Canada, drug companies cannot arbitrarily raise prices even when there is a shortage. Instead, shortages and price spikes may have more to do with a lack of interest in older drugs by companies and doctors. Doctors learn that there is this new drug, so they stop using the old drug, even though there may be thousands of people still using the old drug, the old drug no no longer is profitable, and so companies will stop making it. 
To take back some control of the generic drug supply, a group of major American hospitals has launched a not-for-profit generic drug company. It's their first drug is expected to be ready next year. It hops around from one to another. The bupropion shortage might soon be resolved, but there is a growing list of drugs, leaving empty spaces on pharmacy shelves. Christine Virac, CBC News, Aurora, Ontario. Well, being able to find the drug you need is one thing. Being able to pay for it is something else. A new study out of UBC shows hundreds of thousands of Canadians are going into debt in order to pay for prescription medication. According to the study, just under 3% have borrowed money in the past year to pay for a prescription. That's more than 730,000 people nationwide. Michael Law is Canada Research Chair in Access to Medicine at UBC and one of the authors of that study, and he joins us tonight. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. I think uh, when most people uh, hear about this, they think, you know, seniors are the likely demographic that might be borrowing to cover the cost of prescriptions, but that's not necessarily the case. No, it's actually not the case at all. When we did our study, we ran a survey across Canada. We actually found that the demographic most affected by borrowing was those between 19 and 35 years of age those with lower incomes, those who um, uh, were sicker, and those who didn't have private drug coverage were really the most affected. So presumably they've got to use a credit card, get money from their parents or some other source to try to, to, to cover that cost. Uh, but I mean, when, when those people do have to go into debt to cover the cost of their prescriptions, I, I assume that can affect other parts of their life as well. Yeah, we see that a lot of behaviors going on from people to afford their prescription drugs or frankly, just not take them at all. So in our surveys that we've run, we see people not taking their prescriptions. We see people foregoing food and heat and other medical expenditures. And we also see people borrowing from friends and family members and credit cards in order to make, uh, make ends meet and actually get the medicines that they need. And not taking prescription medicine is probably not a good idea. Yeah, so we actually asked people if it affected their health when they had to not right. take drugs or borrow. And we actually saw lots of people say yes to that question. Yeah. And a lot, like tens of thousands of people reporting extra doctor visits or extra trips to the hospital as a result of that. So where do we go? Well, I mean, what can alleviate ultimately the financial pressure that some of these people are facing? Well, ultimately the financial pressure is when people go to that pharmacy till and get the, get the number given to them by the pharmacist. And it's a big number sometimes, right? Often yeah. it's a very big number. Yeah. Even for people with private insurance plans, when they have to pay 20% of the cost of a several thousand dollar drug, it can add up quite, uh, quite quickly. And we're not talking about these prescription drugs that are super expensive, like, you know, in the thousands and thousands of dollars, these are, are regular type prescriptions. Yeah, most of the time, the drugs that we're seeing people not take mm. and borrow money to get are between 50 and $200, which in terms of prescription drugs are not that expensive. So blood pressure medication, that kind of thing? It's really all over the map. Know. So we saw people not taking drugs for mental health conditions. We saw people not taking things for cardiac conditions, asthma, across the gamut of health problems. We saw people not taking their drugs as directed because of the cost. Intriguing study. All right, Michael, thanks very much for joining us. We appreciate it. Thank you. As the backlash over the provincial government's ride-hailing plan heats up, we'll look at the politics behind the decision.
Thanks for joining us tonight. Here are some of our top stories. Do you have any idea what this is pertaining to? No, I don't. And neither does a sergeant at arms. Suspended. We told you earlier about two high-ranking members of the B.C. legislature who were escorted out this morning by Victoria police officers. The clerk, Craig James, and Sergeant at Arms Gary Lenz have been placed on administrative leave. The move is unprecedented. A criminal investigation is now underway, but the accusations at this point are not clear. As the bloody gang war in the Lower Mainland continues to intensify, nonprofit programs for at risk youth say they're being left high and dry. Federal funding has been running out, even though some say it's needed now more than ever. We are still going to get ride hailing. It might not necessarily be in the form that uh, what we've seen so far in other cities. The BC government's proposed ride hailing legislation leaves some wondering if it'll give consumers any choice at all. Some say it's far too complicated and may force companies like Uber and Lyft to pull out altogether. If passed, the legislation would cap the number of ride hailing cars on the road, going against the fundamental model of ride sharing. Many are now left questioning why the government would take such an approach. With this in mind, we turn to Hamish Telford, political science professor with the University of the Fraser Valley. Hamish, businesses and consumers alike have expressed concerns about this legislation, you know, that it will limit the benefits of services like Uber or Lyft. Can you explain the government's reluctance to introduce ride hailing legislation specifically now? The taxi industry across North America is a very powerful lobby, perhaps more so in British Columbia than it is in other cities in North America. Uh, and the new government, the Liberal, sorry, the NDP government, has been quite um, attentive to the to concerns of the taxi industry. What we've seen when Uber and other ride hailing services have been introduced is that there's a regulatory differential. Uh, the taxi, taxi industry is heavily regulated. Uh, and the ride sharing services are not, and this gives the ride sharing services an economic advantage. So evidently what the government of British Columbia wants to do is to create a more level playing field where there will be a regulatory burden, not just for the taxi industry, but for ride hailing as well. So making uh, ride hailing services require drivers to get special licenses, special insurance, uh, and other regulations that they have to follow to make it more in line with the taxi industry. Which is interesting because before getting elected, John Horgan promised to have ride hailing in BC by the end of 2017. Do you see any real risk of blowback here for the NDP? I do. Uh, I quickly looked at an online poll uh, this afternoon about the direction that the government is taking, and overwhelmingly, people who responded to this poll, 84 percent, uh, said the government was moving too slowly and that ride hailing would not be coming uh, available uh, soon enough. And, and the NDP has strong support in urban Vancouver, uh, particularly amongst younger voters. And these are the people who would want to use ride hailing services. And so I think that they are at some risk of alienating a part of their electoral base. But of course, part of their electoral base is, is many in the taxi industry as well uh, in suburban Vancouver. So they're trying to appease both groups as best they can, but they may be weighing too heavily on the side of the taxi industry for the liking of many. Political scientist Hamish Telford, thank you. You're most welcome. Well, here's a live shot looking east from our studios of uh, Science World BC Place on this Tuesday night. Hope you enjoyed our run of nice weather because it's all coming to an end. Johanna Wagstaff is here with details on when the rain will return and what it likely means for our local mountains next.
so Mike was going to wear a red tie today as well. That it would have been, been yeah. like Christmas. Is it too early though? No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's never too early, right? Never. Well, the red tie was rejected December. by yeah. somebody. Somebody rejected the red tie. Because I thought yeah. we'd be too Christmas yeah. and then. Okay, well now we know we've got a great outfit in about, what, a month? Yeah, sure. Let's see well, if we can get some uh, snow going before then, shall we? Just add to the whole Christmas Make it theme. happen. Uh, I can. <laughs> Let me take you through the time lapse today where we're not talking snow. Uh, we were talking the last of the blue skies. Beautiful sunset to kick off your Tuesday. A few cirrus clouds drifting in after that. Then we saw the alto stratus, those speckly clouds. And then finally overcast. The array of uh, the approaching front. And that's all we've got going on. As I mentioned earlier, rain to start tomorrow morning, followed by uh, some mountain snow, cooler temperatures and showers lingering through the rest of the week. Let's take a look at the temperatures right now. Seven at YVR, six out towards Pitt Meadows, hanging on to a five down towards YYJ. Already starting to see showers approach to Fino, and we'll see that fill in through the overnight. We've basically got overcast skies, still a few breaks between the bands, but overcast definitely through the early morning hours with the rain, Filling in just in time for the morning commute. Here's 7 a.m. and you can actually see some yellows in my uh, future cast where the heavier rain will be coming down for the North Shore. And also notice how low that rain snow line is. This is about 1,200 meters. So we'll start to see that snowfall early in the morning. Uh, throughout the day, it's not a heavy dump of snow, but parts of the local mountains could be looking at 5 to 15, as I mentioned. Pausing you again at 6 p.m. When the actual cold front moves through, this is where we could be looking at some pretty gusty winds also for the evening commute and some heavier downpours as well. So heads up, there's that yellow showing up just after the 6 p.m. hour. Uh, some pooling on the roads and flooding not out of the question tomorrow. So taking it down to a 5 this evening, back up to a 9. Milder tonight than where we were at the past couple of nights. Uh, 9 is about to where we've been sitting at for the most part. Taking you through the bigger picture, high pressure, is sinking off to the south. So that's all she wrote as we open the door to a couple Pacific systems. Uh, the first low actually bringing snow to parts of uh, northern BC. Then we've got that second low sliding in through the overnight. And this is what will bring some steadier rain and snow as well to the local mountains. Uh, right across the province, uh, catching some cooler air that will uh, be conducive to flakes flying. Stewart out of four with some showers, and then we get down to Smithers, starting your day off with snow, switching over to rain, maybe some sunny breaks by the end. Last of the sunny breaks for Prince George tomorrow with highs to five. You'll see some flurries as we head into the end of the week. Whistler Village, snow a possibility for you and definitely getting a good dumping now for the alpine levels. Kamloops and Kelowna looks a little warmer than where we were at today. Starting your day off with snow as well. Snow levels in the interior coming down to about 700 meters. And a zero in through Cranbrook with a, a very chilly start to your day. Let's take a look at the long range forecast where, yes, it does look quite soggy. Temperatures down to a 7 to, as we head into the weekend, so some cooler air moving in, back to double digits for early next week. But all in all, this is about seasonal for temperatures and about seasonal for the kind of pattern we have usually get into this time of the year. It's been a slow start for uh, atmospheric river systems and we are going to uh, see a couple of those before the end of the week. It's time. <laughs> <laughs> We're due. It's time. We're due. It's yeah. time. We've got the snow. I found all the server linings there is to find. So <laughs> no complaining. <laughs> well, thanks very much, Joe. Thanks, Joe. The investigation into alleged sex assaults at a Toronto all-boys private school gets bigger. Police are now investigating four videos as the school starts canceling events planned for the rest of the year.
Wednesday on the Early Edition, our week-long series, Pretty Lonely, continues. We're going to take a look at how the ways we play outside can actually keep people apart. That's tomorrow morning on the Early Edition, beginning at 5 a.m. Police in Toronto have widened the investigation into alleged assaults and sexual assaults at St. Michael's College School. They say they're now looking into more videos. This evening, the school hosts a gathering for its alumni to give them a chance to hear directly from the administration. A day after six teens were charged. Chris Glover has more. You won't see much of this at St. Mike's for a while. A heaviness hangs over this campus as students learn for the rest of 2018 no extracurricular activities or midterm exams. I love this place. This place was my life, you know, and so that's why it hurts when I hear what's happened. St. Michael's College School alumnus Robert Grassi is now a York Regional Councillor. Back in the 70s, the football player says he never witnessed violence or intimidation at the school. Well, I'm disappointed, um, but I think the important thing is that um, there isn't a culture that uh, where this prevailed at this school. Meanwhile, police say new violent crimes at St. Mike's are being investigated, including another alleged assault with a weapon. I will disclose that the weapon um, is a belt, and I'm doing so for the purposes of, of stimulating anyone who may have information in relation to this video. Alumnus Jean-Paul Bedard came forward to say in the early 1980s he was hazed at St. Mike's and has lived with the pain and shame of the sexual violence ever since. What happens is you get three or four bullies who find a vulnerable kid and then there's this pack mentality and the hazing happens. But Grassi worries people are using this moment to attack the institution he owes his life to. In my experience with the hundreds and thousands of individuals, guys that went to the school and people that were part of the alumni, never once in my whole time that I was associated with St. Mike's did I hear of anyone being physically or sexually abused. To just call St. Mike's, you know, this jock school, I fr frankly, I think is a disservice to the school. Outgoing Toronto City Councillor Joe Mahevic attended St. Mike's in the 70s. He applauds the review the school has now committed to conducting, but he doesn't think this is an isolated incident to his alma mater, and he worries about an all-out ban on extracurriculars. I don't think all the students uh, at the school should be punished. Sports is a place uh, at, frankly, every school where people learn all kinds of things, and of course, many of them are positive. Toronto police say they are not aware of any alleged crimes happening at any other schools, but it is clear that other private schools in the city are paying attention. The president at Upper Canada College recently told the student body that any incidents of harassment or assault of any kind will not be tolerated. Chris Glover, CBC News, Toronto. It appears the Trump administration will not punish Saudi Arabia's regime for the murder of journalist Jamal Khashoggi. The president says the U.S. relationship with Saudi Arabia is too important to the country's economy and security. The CBC's Ellen Morrow is in Washington with more. President Trump outlined today why we're not going to see a tougher stance from his administration against Saudi Arabia in response to the killing of Jamal Khashoggi inside the Saudi consulate in Istanbul. President Trump released a statement this afternoon talking about the importance of the Saudi relationship, saying that the U.S. intends to remain a, quote, steadfast partner of Saudi Arabia. The statement also refers to the amount of money, billions of dollars, Saudi Arabia has agreed agreed to spend on arms deals with the United States. For those reasons, President Trump has no plans to punish the Saudis, and he said any intelligence community assessment that Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman ordered Khashoggi's killing is inconclusive. Here's a bit more of what President Trump had to say. Right now, we have oil prices in great shape. I'm not going to destroy the world economy, and I'm not going to destroy the economy for our country by being foolish with Saudi Arabia. 
There have already been criticisms of this stance from the White House. Democratic Senator Dianne Feinstein says she is shocked that Trump will not punish the Saudis for what she called the premeditated murder of Khashoggi. We've also heard from House uh, Democratic Congressman Adam Schiff, who will lead the House Intelligence Committee, saying that the committee will investigate the killing and criticizing what President Trump had to say this afternoon. There is a question of whether Congress may force the White House to do more, but President Trump says he will only do so if it's in line with national security interests, and he says preserving the Saudi relationship is an important part of those interests. Ellen Morrow, CBC News, Washington. And the U.S. president is defending his daughter after a report that Ivanka Trunk has been using a private email account for government business. So what Ivanka did, it's all in the presidential records. Everything is there. There was no deletion. There was no nothing. What it is is a false story. The Washington Post is reporting Ivanka had used her personal email hundreds of times to contact other officials in her father's administration. Both during his campaign and after becoming president, Donald Trump relentlessly attacked Democratic challenger Hillary Clinton for using a private email server during her time as Secretary of State. Interpol, the international police organization, is set to elect a new president tomorrow. The top contender is a former Kremlin official, and that is causing concern. As the CBC's Chris Brown reports, some of Vladimir Putin's critics fear Moscow would abuse the post to hunt down its opponents. A ferocious critic of Vladimir Putin, British-American businessman Bill Browder is a wanted man in Russia. Authorities here have tried and failed to have him arrested through Interpol seven times. And now Vladimir Putin could soon have one of his own generals, Alexander Prokopchuk, in a position to make those arrests stick if, as expected, he's picked to head up the agency. To put his representative in charge of the, the most important international crime-fighting organization is like putting um, the mafia in charge. Browder spearheaded Magnitsky legislation in Canada, the U.S. and Europe, which has been used to sanction corrupt Russian officials. In response, Putin's government has hit Browder with a slew of unfounded criminal charges. Today, a who's who of prominent Putin critics join together to try to head off Prokopchuk's election. Whoever is the Kremlin official who becomes the president of Interpol, however professionally accomplished that person may be, he or she will have to follow orders from the Kremlin. And this is exactly what General Prokopchuk will be doing. Interpol's troubled leadership problems burst into the open last month with the arrest of its president, Ming Hongwei, in his native China, allegedly for corruption. That opened the door for Prokopchuk, the agency's number two to take over. A possibility that clearly excites the Kremlin leadership. The so-called civilized world is united in their Russophobia, exclaimed a host on Kremlin-sponsored state TV, suggesting Western fears about judicial abuses are ridiculous. The Interpol election clearly caught Putin's critics off guard and today's pushback may come too late. The plan B, they say, is a legal challenge to try to get Russia thrown out of Interpol for using the agency to settle political scores. Chris Brown, CBC News, Moscow. Well, it may soon get more expensive to supersize your fries. A dry summer and a cold fall have wreaked havoc on Canada's potato crops. As CBC's Cameron McIntosh explains, millions of dollars worth of potatoes are rotting in the ground from Manitoba to PEI. Under that snow, Chad Berry's potatoes are frozen and rotting. Well, it's hoping, not real encouraging, but you hope better for next year. Others are spoiling in the bin. It's going to be garbage. The cold, wet fall making this potato harvest one of the worst in memory. 8% of the crop was left in the field, was not harvested, and there is a fair chunk that's in the bin that probably is in rough shape that maybe might have trouble marketing through the year. For Manitoba, losses will total about $15 million. Not catastrophic, but compounding what could become a national potato shortage. In PEI, a similar story, where hopes for recovery from a rough season last year are, well, being mashed. It's tough to be in a boat that's going down together, but we are, we're in a tough boat. 
PEI and Manitoba are Canada's two largest potato producers. While a shortage isn't being felt in grocery stores yet, potato processors are starting to look elsewhere. Portage La Prairie is home to two of Canada's largest potato processing plants, one expanding to be one of North America's largest. To keep them going, potatoes will likely need to come in from the U.S. Adding to all this, drought in Europe. More than 25% of potato crops were lost there, stretching global supplies. As inventories dwindle, Canadian prices could rise. Uh, we're looking at, at a loss of several million hundredweight of potatoes. Kevin McIsaac is with the United Potato Growers of Canada. Uh, we know that our supply is less. Uh, we would say we have the same demand as last year, so we would expect to see prices uh, increase somewhat. For now, what's being left behind is a write-off. We're done here now. There's no way we'll be digging anymore. This year's frozen crop will be next year's fertilizer. Cameron McIntosh, CBC News, Portage La Prairie. And while it was a bad year for potatoes in much of the country here in BC, our crop actually fared pretty well. We reached out to the BC Potato Association. They say a dry spring and a window of dry weather around Thanksgiving provided good conditions for potato harvesters. That said, BC spuds make up only 2% of the Canadian potato crop. So, small potatoes. Small potatoes. There you go. <laughs> Well, after months of work, a special unveiling ceremony in Victoria today. The powerful message behind this totem pole coming up. Amy Bell, and here's what's in your CBC Vancouver inbox. Clear your calendar for December 7th. It's CBC Radio Canada's 32nd Annual Open House and Food Bank Day. Join me and other CBC personalities at 700 Hamilton Street for live broadcasts, musical performances, and tours of the newsroom. Last year, we raised almost $800,000 for food banks across BC. For more from CBC Vancouver, check us out online. Well, a summer-long project designed to promote reconciliation between Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples was unveiled in Victoria today. Politicians, dancers and First Nations leaders were on hand for the dedication of the Crossing Cultures and Healing Totem Pole. Now, part of the ceremony was the scattering of Swan Down. It signifies a commitment between the BC government and First Nations to provide better health care. 
The totem pole was quite the fixture in Victoria over the summer. Two carvers worked on the pole on the grounds of the Royal BC Museum. Tourists and passerbys were invited to participate and carve out a wood chip or two. Nice and ceremony and a nice totem pole. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Hmm. Well, I don't know if I can read this one with a serious no, face. You no. <laughs> <laughs> it's Otter Madness at Vancouver's Sun Yat Sen Garden today after one wayward water mammal made its way into the koi pond. The otter tends to be in this area, would hop up here to dry off, would look inside, it's nice, it's kind of a cozy looking cave style. Park board staff were on site again today. The critter caper dates back to Sunday when staff noticed the river otter swimming in the shallows. Just where the creature came from remains unclear, but it unfortunately brought its appetite. The otter has allegedly snacked on about half the more than a dozen adult koi swimming in the pond, some of whom may have been alive for decades. I mean, we have otters throughout our system. Uh, Vanier Park, Stanley Park, uh, Hinge Park. Uh, we've had one recently. We've had beavers there that are chopping down our new trees. Uh, but to, in Sun Yat-sen, absolutely not. It's such a unique facility in the middle of the city, particularly here. I mean, we've got busy streets. Uh, how it got here and survived, I don't know. The park board plans to trap the otter. Ha that those plans have so far proven unsuccessful. Once captured, though, uh, Norman says the otter will be transported to Beaver Lake in Stanley Park. And I've just got—I just got to give it to the beaver, though. I mean, obviously, we don't want him eating decades-old no. koi, but. Mm -hmm. Smart guy. He's making headlines. Exactly. <laughs> when that, what was it? Was it a was it that snake like fish that was in Trout Lake or something? Oh, yes. Was that like yeah. get him to eat that? <laughs> <laughs> it's all one big system. Thanks for you, watching. Thanks for watching. <laughs>